kind of shit. And I can objectively. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you're tuning in from. Uh, Strike the Box Thirsty Thursday, number nine. Uh, tonight, we're talking about that surprise technical rescue that you get. Um, and here with us tonight, we have uh, Herbie Tyler from National Rescue Consultants. Uh, so as we'll do like we normally do, uh, we'll kick it around the room so everybody can introduce themselves. Again, Ben Waples, Salisbury, Maryland, a volunteer fire captain here uh, with 13 years in Salisbury. Um, and happy to, to be here tonight with these, these wonderful gentlemen. Uh, so we'll kick it over to Trevor and take it, take it from there. All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Uh, Trevor Steedman. I worked with uh, a couple of these guys on the screen directly for uh, a lot of my career. I spent 29 years out of my 33 up in Maryland in uh, Ocean City. Uh, part of my function up there was running special operations. So this topic tonight is very near to my, near and dear to my heart. Uh, the rest of the time I've been down here in South Florida where I had the pleasure to be uh, introduced to Mr. Herbie Tyler and, uh, I'll let him do his own intro after we get done with Bobby, but uh, really thrilled to have Herbie on tonight. Really glad he agreed to come on. He's uh, got a lot of experience behind him, and he, he's a fireman's fireman. Not only does he uh, work on a squad company in a busy metropolitan department down here in South Florida, but also owns National Rescue Consultants and uh, not only travels the country, but the world, kind of spreading the word on this stuff. So uh, he's been a great friend to us uh, in my department. And I uh, look forward to tonight's broadcast. So with that, I'll pick, to pitch it over to you, Bobby. Oh, thanks, Trevor. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome, Herbie. Good to have you here, brother. Um, Bobby McGee, 32 years in the fire service, uh, currently working in Ocean City, Maryland as a lieutenant there. Um, and uh, got all kinds of certificates you can hang on the wall, which don't really get me down the hallway at all, but they look good. Framed. Um, and uh, with that, I'll give it to Herbie for a little intro there, brother. All right. Thanks for having me, guys. My name's Herb Tyler. Been in the fire service 17 years. 15 of my years have been in uh, special operations. Uh, been able to travel the world to teach in urban search and rescue since 2008. Uh, like Trevor said, I'm on my assigned to a special operations unit. I'm on the state and local USAR team. And uh, don't have much knowledge, but what I do have, I, I enjoy giving it to anyone that's willing to listen. So uh, I appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, thanks, man. And as, as we typically do, cheers, guys. It's always great to have you here. So one of the things we wanted to kind of kick things off with um, and, and talk about was, you know, you're that, that first arriving engine company truck company, whatever, and, and being able to identify um, when you need to call for those additional special resources. Uh, so a, a collapse unit, a trench unit, uh, that rogue rescue team, whatever whatever it is. Um, but what are what are we looking for? What are the things that we need to identify and quickly to, to figure out that we, we have a technical rescue and you know we can we can probably John Wayne it and MacGyver it and maybe figure something out, but when it goes from sugar to shit, um, and, it, and it may end up in a, in a court, you know, what could we have done to prevent that and make sure that the, the end result is what we want? So I think that's going to be our first topic tonight is, you know, what what are those things that we need to look for to help us identify and help us realize that, hey, this is really kind of out of our comfort zone. You know, I may have had that trench class. I'm Like Bobby said, he's got a bunch of certificates that look great on the wall. And, and working with Bobby, I can tell you, um, He's not afraid to make the push down the hallway regarding, regardless of the certificates he has, um, and, and as many as they are. But, you, you know, talking about a fireman's fireman, that's that's Bobby McGee right there. Um, but I, I have the trench certificate. I have the high angle rope certificate. But it's been years since, you know, going through the class, since running a trench call, running a ropes call. You know, what what are the things uh, that we can that we can look at and look to? Uh, in order to um, make sure that we don't get ourselves jammed up. So, um, Herbie, if you want to kick it off with that and kind of go around the room again to, you know, from our past experiences to identify, you know, some of the things that have helped us in the past. Well, I mean, uh, so the biggest thing that I've seen across the board is guys are so quick to not want to call additional resources. 
they're quick to say, okay, we're, we're going to John Wayne. It. We're, we've always done it this way. We'll figure it out. Well, you can't do that because you're going to end up getting yourself really hurt. So that initial arrival on scene and, and you see something that is out of your comfort zone, get those resources going. So if you're in a big city or if you're in a, a very rural area, know where your technical rescue teams are at. They might be two counties away. Well, if they're two counties away and that's your only team, well, guess what? You need to get those guys rolling as soon as possible because time is of the essence. So understanding that if it's out of your wheelhouse, get the correct unit responding immediately. And the quicker we can get that team coming, the better off we're going to be. Thanks, uh, Trevor, Bobby. Uh, Harvey, on, on that same line, uh, you know, we look at different things. Uh, you, it, we're, I used to work in Ocean City with Bobby and Ben. Uh, you know, we had dedicated heavy rescue units and a lot of equipment, a lot of stuff, and we were pretty self-sufficient, just like you are in West Palm. So you can not only uh, start an incident, but also probably stabilize and see it through to the end. That's not the majority of departments in the United States, where, like you talked about, your special operations or those specialized units may be one to two counties away, and not just minutes away, but hours in some cases. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about, and you, you're very familiar with uh, my department, very small area, but we have a lot of stuff packed in a small area. Can you talk a little bit about how to pre-plan your first do, whether or not that you have a dedicated special operations team or unit in your department or close by, but not only from the pre-planning part of it, but also some of the capabilities and limitations of that first do engine, that first do truck, that they can start on an incident to at least start to stabilize it. And what are the things that you, as the incoming special operations officer, what do you want to hear from that first do uh, company level officer information to make it a seamless transition once you get on the scene? If you don't mind talking to that for a few, a few minutes. No, no, absolutely. So you hit a couple points. The, the biggest thing for one, if you have a technical rescue team, a heavy rescue, wherever it's located, whoever's going to be that responding unit for you. I encourage you to go out and introduce yourself to them, see what equipment they have, see what they're looking for, because each officer is going to be different, obviously. But build that rapport with them. That's going to be crucial. Two, when you arrive on scene, when we go to the fire where we, get, we try to keep our conversation, our first scene size up, keep that radio traffic down because we're trying to get in, give just a quick picture. Well, that quick picture no longer is what we need. Now we want a detailed description of what we have going on. So I need to know patients, what, what we actually have. There's many departments out there that are running rope and confine on one truck. They're running trench and structural collapse on another truck. If you're not painting a detailed description for them, well, they might start rolling a different truck than what you actually need. So paint that detailed description of the actual incident, which is, I know is totally different than what we normally do when it comes to fires, because we're trying to get that first line in play. We're giving a quick scene size up. Now we want to transition. We want that detailed description of the scene. Right, and Herbie, you also, we were talking offline the other day about um, you're not limiting yourself to what's on the big red toolbox with wheels. And if you could talk a little bit about that, you not only mentioned about the regular uh, field units talking to the special operations guys. And in a minute, I'm going to get you to show people what the squad knot is if they're not if they're not familiar with that. Uh, but also, what what are some other resources and people, whether it's within your municipality, your county? Let's let's talk about having a building collapse, hurricane comes through, or uh, I think you guys have one down in West Palmer County have one the other day. Uh, building just collapses, not even a fire instance. So now it's going to be a uh, structural collapse rescue. Who are some other people outside the fire service that you would want to have on, on your speed dial? Oh, I mean, so we, we peer, uh, apologize, preach this in every class that we do for structural collapse. If you're a company officer, you should have the building engineer's number in your phone. So the reason for that, you got a building collapse. Well, guess what? I'm calling him out no matter what time of the day it is. So having that building engineer. Now taking time to invest in your people and understand what your people actually have going on. So are they doing 
Are they a mechanic? Are they a welder? Are they a fabricator? Using the correct people for the job. Because when we get on that call, well, guess what? If we got a guy with his hand stuck in a piece of machinery, well, the guy down at station two, station four, whatever the case may be, he might be a mechanic that works on those uh, pieces of machinery. Well, who else better to know that piece of machinery than that guy? So I might be doing a special call out to have him come to the scene for that reason. Good deal. And then, uh, Bobby, from your perspective, uh, you know, a lot of our guys, we talked about this too, a lot of guys in the fire service, guys and gals, used to come from the trades. They were welders, they were plumbers, they were electricians. They knew how to work with their hands and work with tools. We've seen a definitive shift in the fire service in more recent years where people are more technologically based. If, if there's not an app on their phone for it, they might not be familiar with how to do some of these processes. And taking it a step further, you go to an industrial setting where the guy who works on that machinery might not live anywhere close by. And Herbie, you had mentioned uh, this, and I want Bobby to talk about this for a second because of your background with metal, working with metal and welding. Um, you know, being able to reach out using that technology in a, in a positive way to be able to maybe get that person online or on the phone or FaceTime or Zoom, whatever it is with them. If you have someone stuck in a, a machine press, the person who maintains that is probably the best person in the world to tell you how to take it apart without hurting yourself or your crew. So Bobby, from um, from someone who works with metal, welding and that kind of stuff, what are, what are some things in the back of your mind that you're looking at and putting both hats on as somebody who you know, comes from the trades and also somebody who uh, is a company level officer or actually command level officer as well. Uh, what are some of those things? How do you blend that? Yeah. Um, well, I, uh, you know, I, I, not knowing what I want to do when I grew up, um, I took a lot of different classes and trades. So I trained to be an auto mechanic. I trained to be uh, in the Navy. I was a diesel mechanic in addition to a fireman. Um, you know, I worked in construction, uh, worked in a lot of things and, and apparently all that stuff lent well to the fire service. All that being said, um, technical rescue is way above me. Um, you know, you really need to have specialized training in that because even even if I weld something together, uh, when I want to make something fit, I kind of move it around um, and it has tension in it. Once I weld it, you can't see that tension. Um, it can have torsional tension. It can have uh, lateral tension and all that kind of stuff. And uh, <laughs> when I was learning to weld it more so than, than probably some better welders out there. Uh, so you'll not know that tension until you cut it. Um, and it could go left, it could go right. I've seen them, uh, I've seen people cut uh, tube, uh, square tubing and have it actually torque, um, uh, torque about a quarter of a turn around because it had a torsional tension on it, basically. So when you got people trapped in there, uh, even with all my experience, um, I really would like to lean on, especially rescue guys like Herbie, um, because this is exactly what they look at. You know, how much is a, a cubic foot of concrete? How many cubic feet of concrete do we have? How many of that kind of stuff? Because if you don't know those numbers and you start trying to take a, a, a stabilization for a vehicle and put it underneath of a building, uh, you're going to quickly find out that that's not the right choice. So um, I, I, I think the other side of it is I've always been in slow, I don't want to say slower, but, but not well-staffed departments. And um, I've never worked anywhere where we had a true dedicated um, heavy rescue with staff, with people trained that way. Uh, we tend to have regional areas um, that, that they put guys together that are interested in that and they do technical rescue teams. Um, yeah, I know Worcester County, Sussex County, they have different types of teams for hazmats and, and, and uh, technical rescue and, and things like that. And I, I think that's good. Um, but you also, I think as a, as a frontline officer, um, you, you have to, you have to balance um, getting the right team there, um, and that's an early call. But you also have to balance. Sometimes you're just going to have to do what you're going to have to do. Um, you know, the, the, the person has to survive. So the reason I'm saying all that is Herbie said it earlier. You know, we run lines and we throw ladders, and that's, that's kind of our bread and butter. Um, you know, uh, but when you get into technical rescue, um, you need to really slow down. You, you've got to do it right the first time. Because when you don't know that torsional load, or you don't know what that machine does, or you don't know what's going to let what's going to happen with that machine when you cut this piece of it, and it's not right, um, you, you'll not recover from that. Um, you know, twice in my career I've seen um, vehicle extrications go horribly wrong. Uh, once it was just embarrassing, and the other time it was 
catastrophic to the patient. Uh, so in 32 years, I've seen that twice. And that's supposed to be our bread and butter. That's supposed to be what fire departments go to. So even those things that we call bread and butter, simple operations, I've seen them go wrong. So I just take that and extrapolate that out to if you're in a, something you don't understand, a machine you don't understand or something like that, you need to call for some people really, really early. If you don't have a technical rescue team, find the guy that works on that farm machine, you know, find the maintenance guy in that factory, find, you know, like Herbie said, the building engineer that can tell you how much weight and, and things like that, because whatever resources you can find um, are going to be helpful to you. And, and the biggest thing is you have to listen to them. You know, in the fire department, we tend to always know it all. Um, it's just kind of how we operate. But a lot of times you get this guy comes in in a factory or in an industrial setting um, and he, he may know more than you and you just got to be willing to listen. So that's that's kind of my spin on it is call these teams really early because like our teams are regional. So it takes people getting together and getting trailers and getting on their way and all those types of things. So as soon as you think it's something like that, get them started. You can always cancel them later. So that's. That's kind of my spin on it is, um, you know, even though I feel like I have like a general good general knowledge, um, you know, it's not I really would like to have people that really train specifically on that type of stuff. Thanks, Bobby, for that. And what, one of the things we talked about the other day, just to clue everybody in on it, was a lot of departments might get there and feel they don't have a technical rescue capability just because they don't have that big truck that says heavy rescue or squad written down the side. And that doesn't mean that you can't start to stabilize an incident. So, Herbie, you've taught not only just around the country, but around the world and, you know, civilian, military. What are some things and uh, pretend for a second that you and I don't know each other and I asked you to come into my department as a small department that I'm in at this point. What are some things that you would tell me of how to begin a technical rescue incident so I'm just not having a bunch of spectators and turnout gear with good seats? Well, so the first thing I'm going to tell you is take a second and, and step back, look at the overall picture. Once you take and, and get that picture, you're, you're going to be able to sit there and start evaluating the scene. Once you evaluate that scene, we're going to be able to do some basic stuff. If Let's take a trench call. We got heavy machinery running the trench. We got the victim in there. We got the foreman on the job, whatever the case may be. There's stuff that that first arriving engine, ladder, ambulance, whatever it is, there's a lot that they can do. So they don't need to just stand around. And with that being said, they, they can sit there. They can do lockout tag out of the vehicles. They can get that form and, and get a good picture of what they were doing. If they're doing a trench call, well, what were you doing in the trench? Were you cutting and burning? Were you installing new pipes? What were they doing? Where was the last guy seen? Was there any indicator of, was there water bottles thrown outside? There's things like that, that we can start getting our guys to start doing. On top of that, the big thing is that guys always seem to forget every apparatus has a four gas monitor on there. So start Monitoring our air. under get us a good uh, air reading because now if he's overcome by gas well guess what we all have fans on our trucks it might not be the best it might not be the true vent fan that we have for confined space but guess what it, nothing is uh something's better than nothing right doing that getting getting some basic steps going so once the heavy rescue gets there the squad company gets there you guys aren't just standing around with your with, with your thumbs in your uh, pockets. Let's get moving. Start doing stuff. So start with the basics. Use a little common sense. The the big thing is get the foreman or whoever else was on that job site where that, that individual was. Find out what they were doing, how old they are. Get as much information as you possibly can. The, the machinery is a big thing as well. If we can lock out and tag out, well, let's get all that stuff turn off right away that's good so hey herbie can you do us a favor you know you talked about trench rescue a little bit why don't you walk us through what your team's going to do when they get there so um if you tell us a little bit more about exactly what's going to happen with a, let's say a trench rescue 
um, then maybe we'll be better prepared or at least get the scene better prepared for you guys. Because Can you walk through just a trench rescue for us and talk about what you're going to do as a team to, to stabilize the trench, to get to the victim, to stabilize the area a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so if it comes out as a, as a trench rescue call, uh, we, we've all been victims of it. When, especially on fires, the first thing we want to do is we want to pull that apparatus as close to that fire as possible. It, it happens to all of us. Every single one of us on on this uh, call right now have done it. On a trench call, the last thing we want to do is pull our apparatus as close to that call as possible because we don't want to start disturbing the soil that's already compromised already. So we're going to go out. We're going to evaluate when we're walking up. We're looking for any indicators of where that victim might be. Then before we start walking, we're going to put down ground pads. So just a piece of plywood, distribute the weight while we're working along the trench itself. Now, once we lay down our ground pads and we start working the ground pads, so we lay down the ground pads, now we can start doing some more work, right? The ground pads are gonna be number one, but we gotta start monitoring the air. That is one of the biggest things that I see guys lack on. Everyone forgets to, to do air monitoring. Well, we don't forget to do air monitoring in confined space because it's beating our head. Well, we need to air monitor as well in trench, right? Even if your air reading is perfectly fine, I tell my guys, hey, put that vent fan in. Because I'm in South Florida. We got a guy in a trench in South Florida. It doesn't matter if it's December, it's still hot as hell. So if he's just crush injury, whatever, that fresh air that's coming over him, that's helping him out. Then we got to put our ladders in there, one for us, and then hopefully they can, uh, if they can self-rescue, well, we gave them a ladder to help them get out possibly. Once we get our ladders in there, then we're going to start preparing to get our fin forms in there. So once we start getting our fin forms in, now we start building that trench box. I know everyone here is probably driven down the road. They've seen uh, work going on in a trench and you see that big old metal box on the side. Well, that's the trench box. They should be working inside of it, but if it hinders their operation, they don't have to. So it just has to be on the footprint. So we're going to build our own supplemental trench box. So, and we can, we can do that by Paratex, Airshores, lumber. We can do it with lumber and screw jacks. There's a bunch of different ways that we can secure a trench. So it all, it all depends on what your department is uh, capable of. So a lot of departments have Paratex, so they, they'll utilize Paratex. If they don't have Paratex, they might use a LS screw jack and four by fours. Cool, one, one more thing if you wanna talk, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, a lot of us, uh, a lot of us aren't really experienced in trench rescue. I've, I've been to a, a couple myself, but um, just can you talk to them a little bit about how much that, that, that work, that the, the weight of that dirt or sand or whatever's around the victim is, is a lot of times people think they can just jump in there and snatch these people out. Can you talk a little bit about the, the challenges of trying to snatch somebody out of one of those situations without the protection that you get, do you just talk about? Absolutely. So we've all seen the videos on YouTube. They, there's a worker that falls inside. They, they try to put a rope in there tied to a uh, backhoe, try to pull them out. Well, if you think about what happens, if I, if I got my victim in here, every time I move and I take a breath, all my, all my fill is coming back in on him. So every breath he takes, everything is just gonna keep sucking him in, in, uh, in layman's terms. So with that being said, you're not gonna just rip that guy out because I hate to say, you're, you're gonna end up taking a limb off. So we gotta secure our area to get our guys in and you're gonna start just digging buckets out, five gallon buckets, and you're gonna get that, you're gonna get that soil out of there until we get that guy free. Once we get them free, now we're gonna put them on some type of uh, uh, spinal immobilization to get him out, make it uh, easier for our rescue teams. But if, if you think that soil isn't gonna be that heavy, whether it's sand, whether it's uh, uh, anything, it, it could be Georgia clay. I tell you this, go, go put a five gallon bucket in there, fill it up to the top, and I want you to lift it up and you tell me how easy it is. Now you do about 
400 of those five gallon buckets and uh, tell me you're just going to snatch somebody out. It's not going to be that easy. I promise you. Well, one of the things that I think we've mentioned so far, or I think we've kind of, I don't think we specifically talked about it or, or mentioned it, um, but is the, the nature of this and all of technical rescue being so manpower intensive. Um, you know, again, we were talking the other night, um, I think Herb, you guys were saying that you guys get a technical rescue call and, and you're rolling in with just nine, nine guys specific to your, um, like with a squad, your engine, your medic unit that goes with you guys, um, not, not counting the other first arriving, the first two engines, trucks, medic units, whatever. Um, you know, so that's just something I wanted to throw out, like as we were transitioning, um, maybe from one topic or one, one type of rescue to another is that th this is all going to be very manpower intensive. Um, and to, to get those additional resources, um, you know, yeah, call for your technical rescue, call for those, those teams, but, um, you know, make sure you have enough people to, to do whatever, whatever else it is. And, um, you know, I think one of the things we also mentioned in regards to that is we don't need everybody there to be the technical rescue specialists. There's a lot of other stuff that that our new members can do, or um, you know, other people can can take care of, while the, the special while we support the technical rescue team. So that's just one of the things I wanted to throw in there, and I thought that was a good time. So, um, yeah. Yeah, Ben, I, I agree with you on that. <clears throat> and one of the things that I know I encourage my folks to do, whether it's for fire related, rescue related, EMS related. It's know your first do, know what's going on in your first do, be nosy. If you're out riding around in the rig, uh, you, you've got to go get fuel at some time. You're probably going to go get food. You know, whatever your daily operations are to take you outside that fire station. Uh, I know myself, when I get into work in the morning, I interface with the off-going and oncoming crew, and I ride through my first do area. I'm looking for construction sites. I'm, I'm looking at things that are not just normal, but you know, things that should be there and aren't, and things that are there that shouldn't be. So I'm looking at a construction site with uncapped rebar, or I'm looking at um, a swing stage scaffold on the side of a building, or I'm looking at you know, just something that's a, a, a larger uh, vessel down to the marina than what we're used to. So I encourage the folks to always go and look around and ask them the question, if we have a call there today, what are you gonna do? And I'm not asking them to mitigate the entire incident start, start to finish, but if you get this call in the next five minutes, what is your plan? Who are you going to call? What are your resources? And I can't say enough, and Herbie had touched on this, and I'm going to ask him to uh, delve a little bit deeper into it, is know your area resources as well. Sometimes those resources and the availability of those resources will change, but you, you have to develop the relationships and interface with these people because you might have an expectation of that resource that they're not capable of handling, not because they're bad or stupid people by any means, but it's beyond the scope of what they can do. So if you, let's say, for example, if you call for um, a specialized aerial truck to be able to come in, whether it might be an articulating boom or a telescoping boom, a straight stick, whatever, do you know if that department trains to that? Or are you going to call them in and say, hey, I need you to be a, a high anchor point for me. Then all of a sudden they look at you like you have three heads because they've not trained on it. So these are the things you, know, you, you can't sit there and uh, expect people to just gel all of a sudden. You have to train these things. You have to train to success and train to failure. But I can't say enough for going out in your first do and saying uh, what are not only the possibilities, but the probabilities of something happen, happening. Um, back in Ocean City, I know I used to get cussed a lot uh, when I was running training because we would we put these scenarios out there. And people like, oh, that crap's never going to happen. Well, you know. How many times do we have cars go off the fifth floor of the parking garage downtown and you pancake upside down on another vehicle or you come off the front and be suspended, those types of things. So expect the unexpected, even if you're not in a dynamic area that might have a lot of different things going on. You might be in a rural area where you get a, a farmer hung up in a piece of farm machinery. It, it really doesn't matter. So, Herbie, can you talk a little bit about when, when you start your day? on a special operations unit, what are some things that you're looking for? Or what would you encourage the company level officers on engine companies, truck companies, and uh, paramedic units as they're going through their first do? What are some things that would be good for them to observe and relay? Uh, you, you hit it perfectly. 
when you go out there and you start going around your first do, look at the could this happen? And I can't reiterate that enough. If you can dream it, it's probably the possibility of it happening is there. Um, I hear it a lot, especially in smaller departments. Well, that's never going to happen here. It's never going to happen here. But guess what? It's going to happen there. It might not happen today. It might not happen tomorrow, but it's going to happen. I promise you. So the biggest thing that I can, I can hit on is you need to be out in your first two area. There, there's, there's plenty of time for you to go sit in a chair and relax, but you need to be out there training, doing that mutual training with those specialized units. And just like uh, Trevor said, understand their resources because you might be on YouTube and you see something that you think is cool as hell. Well, that unit might not be trained up on that or it might be unsafe just because you see it on the internet doesn't mean it's correct. Um, so, so that's my little excerpt that uh, I always say all the time, I promise you. Uh, but you need to go out there and go through your first two areas. And I promise you, if there's a construction site out there, and if you get out of the rig and you go up to the, uh, the guy in charge, he'll walk you around and show you what they're doing. They love seeing the firemen out there because we're not there to inspect and we're not there to do anything. We just want to know, what are you guys doing? That's the best time to go through and start pre-planning for the what ifs. If you, you see uh, the road workers digging a trench on the side of the road, well, pull the rig over. It takes 10 minutes. You got 24 hours in a shift, I promise you. It's not gonna hurt you. Go over there, see what they're doing. Walk up, give it a look. Hey, what are you guys up to? What are you guys installing? Oh, this is what we're doing. Oh, how deep is that trench? Okay, they're, going, they're doing uh, underground utilities. How water the how water are those pipes that you guys are going in? All that's doing for us is we're getting that information. So at two o'clock in the morning, if you get that call, you're already ahead of the you're already ahead of the curve. You know some information going into it. You're not going into it blindside. So getting out and familiarizing yourself with with your first two area is huge. You should be able to go out there and, and say, okay, you know what, on X, Y, and Z Street, they're building a a five story building. Over here, they're, they're digging a trench. They're putting in some fiber optic lines. That should be something as a company officer that you should be encouraging your guys to do. You should be out there looking at everything. You guys should be questioning everything that's going on in your first two areas. Herbie, I couldn't agree with you more and to kind of dovetail into something you had mentioned uh, previously in the episode. We're talking about resources that are outside the fire department. We sometimes have that tunnel vision where we, if we think it's not in our first due or our truck or within our battalion, that it doesn't exist. And one of the things I also encourage my folks to do, if they see a crane operating anywhere, go talk to that crane operator, find out what they're operating, what they're hauling, because that might not only be a crane collapse, we might need them as a resource. And, you know, I, I say that quite a bit. And for those of you who ever work in, near, or around uh, construction sites with cranes, those crane operators are phenomenal. And the level of skill all those guys have, and so we're trying to we're trying to rig something up and uh, on, a, let's say, a, a straight stick on one of our ladders, and there's a crane down the street where you might be able to dial that guy up and, and bring him to the scene. They know, they do that a lot more than we do as far as using those angles and, and being able to use that piece of machinery and look at the lifting capability. Um, when we talked about some of the, uh, the or one class, I know Bobby and I have talked several times when we call it go, no, go. And it's, are, you know, what are some resources that you have? We like, we love using for uh, like, let's say rebar impalement. A lot of guys don't use band saws. That's not a typical piece of fire department uh, tool complement unless it's on a, a specialized rescue unit. But your public works department might have six of them. The plumber who's working on a job site on a construction site or on the construction site might have some stuff that you can raid as long as somebody who knows how to use it and can use it safely and effectively. But getting starting to think outside that that toolbox that we have um, is vitally important to me. And uh, so you know, with that, you know, Ben, I know you know, you've worked in a couple different departments uh, that have a lot of potential and especially up there in Salisbury, we have quite a bit of industrial area. What are some things that, that you're, that's going through your mind right now or some things that uh, you would want to interface with someone like Herbie about 
for calls coming up as far as tools, tool compliments? What are some things you should look for or be maybe a little bit more prof proficient on in your department? Yeah, I think one of the things that, um, you know, being in Salisbury and um, some of the stuff that we have going on around here, because there's, there's definitely a lot of construction. Um, there's, there's a giant renovation and revitalization that's going on in our downtown area uh, that at one point, and I think the project is kind of stalled right now, uh, they were taking a, a, a downtown or a main street building and going from, I think it was five floors. Yeah, I think five floors and they were extending that up to 13 floors. Um, all right within the, within the same footprint that it originally started in. Um, and at one point they had just the side walls and the front wall. So as we're, you know, we're going out, we're looking at our, our first due in the morning, you know, I take that ride down Main Street and I see that and it's like, holy cow. You know, we were doing some training in our parking garage, which is just behind that. And we see that and it's like, well, hey, while we're here, let's talk about what happens when this when this building collapses in into Main Street or it all collapses in on itself and we got people working down in our basement. You know, what's our what's our plan? What are we thinking? What are we doing? Um, you know, we're we're fortunate in that Salisbury has um, a pretty, I would say, a pretty extensive special special ops program. Um, unfortunately, the only the thing I would say is that our people are spread out on each shift, um, so we don't have a a specialized rescue or a rescue crew, um, but we have those folks that are on shift every day. Um, but again, getting that, you know, herb they get to roll up with, you know, their squad of, you know, six or seven or, the, or however many people, again, they're responding with, you know, we might have on that day, we might have two or three of our specialty rescue people for that. And, and now we're, you know, as, as an acting, or as a, as an acting assistant or an acting uh, shift supervisor, you know, I'm getting those guys planting them right next to me. Hey, what, what do you need? What do we, where am I calling? Like I already have an idea, you know, I'm, I'm calling, for the, the Sussex County Technical Rescue Team, I'm calling, you know, find out, you know, what our ETA is, if we need the go team, all this kind of stuff. But what specifically are they are they looking and evaluating, like Herbie talked about at the beginning, you know, what do they see and, and are going to anticipate that we're going to need moving forward? Um, the other big thing that, that I think we have is our marina where they're, they're building ships. Uh, I, I know in the past six months, probably a year, we've had at least – two or three calls down there um, that it, it has become a technical rescue just to get them off of the, like it's an EMS call, but it's become a technical rescue to get them off of this elevated platform off this boat uh, that's in dry dock or it's up, it's not even been launched yet that they're still working on. So um, I think like, like we've talked about it, it's just a matter of getting out, seeing that um, we're fortunate in that we have that a uh, man versus machinery kit so all of that, you know, the rebar impalement, the uh, grinders, machinery, all that kind of stuff, we have the ability to get that stuff there um, and, and have the, our personnel show up to use it. Uh, but again, we're not, we're not responding with the, the volume of people, um, you know, that some municipalities are. And it's the same thing in Ocean City. Like we had, we had the people trained, they're the people that know what they're doing, uh, but do we have the volume of people to get it done effectively, efficiently, quickly, um, right away. And, and the reason I, I kind of hesitate with the quickly, like we've talked about, you know, the, the firefighting, you know, we're throwing ladders. We're not, we're not placing ladders. We're not setting ladders. We're throwing ladders to get them up and deploy quickly. We're running lines. We're not, you know, sh yeah, we stretch lines, but we're not taking our time to deploy it. We're, we're getting it out to get it done quickly. And like we talked about it through the rest of this evening is that the fire side, like, yeah, it's all quick and fast, get it done in a hurry. Cause the quicker we put the fire out, our problems go away. You go rushing through a technical rescue and you're only going to end up in trouble. Um, so like we talked about slowing it down, taking our time um, and, and kind of taking that slower approach to it is definitely one of the, one of the things that, um, you know, is going through my mind as we're talking through all of this to, kind of be prepared and it's always something that you know you you start your shift like we talk about we go right around but 
you know, you see, you see something, you know about something. All right. Well, let me just think, what would I do here for this for now? So this is kind of my thoughts. Hey, Herbie, I, I got another question for you, brother. So, um, one of the common calls I think we've all gone to, I'm pretty sure everybody has, is a car into a building. Uh, can you walk through um, what we should be doing initially on a, a wood frame, uh, ordinary construction? You know, just just walk through a little bit about what your guys' thought processes are about cars inside of buildings. Um, you know, when, when should we cry uncle and call in that technical rescue team uh, on a residential structure uh, versus a uh, ordinary construction? Just can you walk us through that a little bit? That's a fairly common call. I think guys would be interested in seeing, you know, what what we we should do versus what we should turf off or get a, a especially rescue team coming. Yeah, no, definitely. It's a uh, so obviously without insulting anyone's uh, intelligence, you want to look at the bigger picture, and I and I keep saying that on on everything that you guys have asked, looking at that bigger picture. So. That might be the time. So if you're on an engine company, ladder company, ambulance, it doesn't matter. You're first arriving. You got that car in the house. People are trapped. Now might be the good time to, to look at your crew or look at that second due engine or ladder company that's arriving right along with you. You might have the contractor that that's his part time job. He does construction. But understanding that for every action, there's a reaction. So I've seen guys say, you know what, let's hook the winch up to it. Let's pull the car out. Well, if we do that and we have people trapped inside, what, what's happening to the people inside? We have the potential of creating more harm to our, our victim inside that uh, in the car, right? So we're going to secure the vehicle. But if we look at it and it say it's just a uh, an overhang, well, we, we might be able to secure that pretty easy. But if they're in the structure and we have to capture a load bearing wall, it's going to take some time. So we're going to have to secure not only the vehicle, but now we need to secure the house as well. So we're going to want to get that technical rescue team out there as soon as possible because they're going to have to throw up maybe a double T. They're going to have to throw up some type of shoring to capture that load. So if they move anything, well, guess what? But the rest of that building isn't going to come crashing down. And depending on where your department is at, like I like I was talking to you guys the other day, getting that building engineer there is crucial because our technical rescue team might be an hour away, but we still have victims trapped inside. The, the old mentality of John Wayne, we'll just figure it out. If we end up hurting that patient and killing that patient, well, someone has to answer for that. So we have to take a step back and then uh, Ben hit on it a bunch. We throw ladders, we're, we're running to get those lines in place. Technical rescue, we got to take a step back, get the overall picture, kind of calculate our moves. Because if I just run up and try to pull the car out, well, what happens if I pull that car out? Is that car actually supporting that load bearing wall? Because now if I move it back, we're going to have a bigger issue because now that building potentially could come down on us. So we have to take a step back, look at it, utilize those personnel that's in place on your, on your truck. He might be a journeyman uh, contractor. Well, guess what? He might know a lot more about building construction than I do. But once you take a moment way before this call comes out and actually know your personnel that's there with you, know their capabilities. Now you're saying, okay, hey, uh, he might be your hydroman. Hey, come here. What's going to happen here if we move this car back? Well, this building's going to come down because look right here, it's being supported by this car. Oh, shit, I didn't see that. So stabilizing not only the vehicle, but stabilizing the structure is huge. And uh, you asked, when would you, when would you know? Um, it, it's it's hard to give a definitive answer on that, but I would tell you that if you remotely have a doubt that you think anything bad could happen, I would say get that team there and let them shore up that structure, because the last thing you want to do 
they start working and then that building comes down not only injures the victims but now it injures our guys and now someone has to answer for it Air, another question just to throw at you real quick so i know we want to get into some other uh, instant types and have you speak on them but a lot of people feel that the technical rescue side of things is so specialized that they really don't have a starting point. I know we addressed some of that as far as pre-planning and initial operations, but my philosophical question for you is, does technical rescue always have to be technical? No. So my thought process on it, and, and uh, you, you and I have a great relationship and, and you know my style of doing things. I'm, I'm a little unorthodox on, on some, of my, some of my things, but I also think common sense comes into play a lot of times. Uh, a lot of times you get the guys with the hard up attitudes of, I'm never gonna call the special ops unit, I'm not gonna call the, re uh, the heavy rescue, we can handle it on our own. The problem is that we're going into a lot of these calls that are true technical rescue calls, but we've always just figured it out. Don't look at it as, well, it, it has to be a building collapse or a trench rescue. It could be something as simple as a kid with his hand stuck in, the, in a game machine or a kid with his head stuck in a, in a freaking uh, stairwell, uh, the guardrail, apologize. It is important for us to understand that if you, if you just take a step back and you look at your heavy rescues, your special ops trucks, they're a bigger toolbox for equipment and supplies and manpower that we can utilize because there's not a person on an engine, a ladder company that's not going to be able to figure it out, whether it's right or wrong, they're going to figure it out. That's just the fireman mentality. We're going to get it done, but not every technical rescue call is going to be a building collapse, a trench call. So understanding that, and being able to realize that your fire truck can only carry so much equipment. And you take that out of the equation, well, we need more tools. Well, where can we get more tools at? Well, we can get tools from our special ops units. And just like you said, Trevor, if you're on a, a building, uh, building construction uh, site, well, there's a shit ton of tools there. And I promise you, if they see one of their guys hurt, they're going to start throwing tools at you. Hey, we got this. We got that. So you might not need tech rescue because guess what? You have the tools right there and you have the personnel that's going to be uh, capable of doing it within their wheelhouse, obviously. And uh, Herb, those are all great points. And just real quick before, because I know uh, you Bobby had some other instant types he wanted to talk about. Some people, and you touched on this, have the feeling that special ops is going to come in and take over their scene or you're, you're you're there and the seas are going to part and the beams of light are going to come through the clouds and everything's going to be okay um so again i think it's about those relationships but when if if i'm the officer on the scene and i've called you could you could you share with the the audience what the squad knot is like when you, when you come up and acknowledge me just just so they can see it they, you get they got to see it once brother just a little quick knob we do one You'll be able to see it. It's one of those secret things. If you're not part of it, I can't. I can't really show it to you. I can just. I can't tell you how to do it, but it just has to be in you. Oh, I, I get it. I get it. It's, it's it's almost like when we talked to Bobby, and we won't we won't uh, dirt him too much. But just for, for those of you out there riding motorcycles, when you when you see the guys on the gold wings and yeah, you know, they wave to you when they're going by, and then you see the guys on the Harley, you're like, kind of the same thing, or hey, hey, or Bobby's. In Bobby's case, the triumph. So anyway, go ahead. So go ahead, Bobby. Back to you. Yeah, the guys are waving real low with the Harleys. They spent too much money on them. So. <laughs> now, um, no, I just uh, it's great talking to you about some of these incidents. And I think the last one that we would like just like to hear where, where you're coming from. This, you know, I know that I work in a town where you have a lot of high rises and things like that. So. Um, high angle rope rescues and things like that are, are, are reality for us, uh, though I still think we could be more prepared for them than we are. Um, but, you know, every single fire department is listening tonight. I guarantee you, you've got a bridge 
where something where a vehicle could be halfway off the edge of it. There's there's every single district has something that could require some type of rope rescue um, lifting device, something like that. So you just want to walk through, um, you know, rope rescues when you when you guys arrive, what what we should be looking for. Um, um, some safe ways to secure the vehicle until the team gets there, those types of things a little bit, Herbie. Yeah, so I can't reiterate enough that I can't give you just a, a, a one way of doing things because if I told you that, I'm ignorant because there's a million ways of doing it. And depending what your department has, you might not have chain, you might not have rope, We've been to these departments that don't have any of this. Well, and to answer your question, if you got a car dangling over the side, well, shit, we got to figure something out. So we need something, right? We need we need to at least try to do something. We might put a winch cable on it if that's all we have. If you have chain, well, we might we might try to rig it with chain. We have to be able to do something to help secure it the best we can until we can get the proper tools to get there. And I can sit here and tell you about all the toys that we have. I'm very fortunate in my department that we, we have a great uh, command staff that gets us whatever we want within reason. So, I mean, we get all, all the brand new toys that are out. Well, I go one County up. They don't have all those cool toys. So I can't tell them, okay, well, I want you to hook X, Y, and Z up if they don't have X, Y, and Z. So depending where you run, if you only have a winch, well, guess what? We're going to hook it up. We're going to maybe pull a little tension. But now when's the last time that uh, any of your guys knew the limitations of that winch? Or do you know the limitations of the chain? Do you have the, the proper chain? Did you buy some cheap, cheap uh, chain from uh, Harbor Freight? I mean, these are the questions that we have to ask ourselves because now if we do something and we try to do our best, but it went south, well, guess who's going to be at fault for that? It's going to be us. And I try to, I try to instill that in, in every uh, person that I come in contact with when we're teaching a class. You can't say, well, we've always done it this way. Well, that doesn't work anymore. And you can't say, well, this is all we had. Well, if that's all you had, did it create more harm? Because if it did, well, guess what? Now your ass is held to the fire. So looking at it, if all you have is rope, well, guess what? You're going to have to figure some type of uh, system to, to kind of secure that vehicle. If you have struts, if you don't have struts, well, if you don't have struts, what are you going to do? Do you have enough uh, lumber to do? cribbing and if you don't have that i mean there there's so many different avenues that we can go down i mean we could literally be on this podcast for two hours just talking about different different uh tips and tricks excuse me but if you don't have the right equipment to do something then it's kind of like what uh you and trevor were talking about uh your class you got to set yourself up for success, but also you also need to know your limitations. What are those limitations? What what equipment do you have? Well, that chain that you have in there, well, have you inspected it? Do we have the right the right hooks on it? All that all that comes into play. So I truly encourage every single person that's listening to this, look at your look at your apparatus, go through those compartments and pull stuff out. Put your hands on it and just see what you actually have. And not everything has to be out in the field to do stuff. You you can tabletop a lot of stuff and learn from it. We could sit here and talk and, all right, well, we got a car hanging over the, the fifth story parking garage. How are we going to secure this with what we have on our truck right now? I get it. It's it's hot as hell. Guys don't want to go outside. All right, well, let's tabletop it. Let's go out in the day. You give me one, you give me one uh, option, you give me an option, let's talk about it. Let's set it up and just see if we even have the capabilities to do it. So 
I encourage everyone to go out and start pulling out equipment out of your apparatus and look at it. Pull up different uh, different scenarios in your head. Go online if you can't if you can't dream about a scenario. Go online and look at some different scenarios. See what they did. See if you can replicate that. Well, do we have the equipment to replicate it? If not, well, now we need to put a request in to our management and try to get some pieces of equipment. Hey, Herb, before you wrap up, um, oh, go ahead, Bobby. Uh, I just had one more go thing. Ahead, Bobby. One thing that I find that often slow uh, to respond to, you talked about the building engineer and we're talking about uh, some of the structural collapse things that we were discussing before. Uh, one of the resources just in every single community that's watching this podcast right now is your record drivers. Um, you know, if you've got any kind of highway around, you've got really heavy wreckers out there and those guys know their chains, they know everything. Um, that's another resource if you don't have a big heavy technical rescue team nearby. And even if you do, you might be able to get a guy off of a wrecker out there. Just, just even if you're just telling them, just keep this thing from moving for me until we get people kind of get people in the car or something. So that's just something I wanted to add on to that was that don't forget about those heavy record companies and stuff in your areas because everybody has them. And those guys are pretty slick about what they do. Yeah, they absolutely are, Bobby. And uh, we've talked about that quite a bit. And the level of skill that they have, especially when we've helped them do rigging for recovering vehicles that have gone overboard or anything else, it's just amazing what they could do. And they're aware of their angles and, and their uh, changes of direction. And it's, it's really, truly amazing. Um, Herb, one of the other things I wanted you to talk about briefly, because uh, we'll wrap it up here in a few minutes and go around the horn again, is the other day we were talking offline, you equated uh, technical rescue, special ops, very much similar to hazmat, where slow is smooth and smooth is fast. You you come in, you take that 30,000 foot view of everything, um, and you, you don't put your ass in gear before you put your head in gear. You really have to assess things, but you have to be dynamic. You can't have that one train of thought and say, this is going to be the way we approach this because things can change really quickly, not just on the scene. You go from stable to unstable, but talk about uh, because these incidents usually take time, not only people, but a lot of time. Uh, let's say, right, if you had an incident that came out at five o'clock in the evening and the sun sets at 630, you know, you're going to have diminishing light. You might have a you know, completely different uh, degree of resources. Sometimes it might be uh, a front coming through. So can you talk, talk about some of those, uh, pr like predicting and, and planning ahead, not only for the incident itself or physically on the scene, but also for your changing environment when that when that happens to you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and we, we talked about it offline the other day. When that call comes out, knowing your personnel, that's the, that's the time to put your strongest people in those spots. That's not the time for, for training at that moment. We, we can do training after the event's over, after we got our victim and, and everything secured. So understanding that when you arrive on scene and we've all done it, especially when we were younger in our career and, and some guys are still that way, it's just, it is what it is. And you, we got to work with it. We start with our blinders like this. Well, over time, it starts going, well, hazmat, technical rescue, dive, all that stuff. You can't have blinders like this because if, if my blinders are like that, guess what? I'm going to get somebody hurt, I promise you. I need to get that big overall view. I need to be able to see for every action, there's a reaction, like I said, as, as cheesy as it sounds, but, but that's the truth. If we're at 5 o'clock at night and I know that we're about to hit uh, dark time around 6.30, well, guess what? If I know this operation is going to take a while, I need to get some lights out there. What else do I need to get? I need to make sure that I have the right the right tools for the job. I also need to see if I have plan A, I better have plan D as well. Because if A doesn't work, B doesn't work, C doesn't work, guess what? We're, we are the last line of, of defense right there. You're calling us because shit hit the fan. So we better have every plan in play for anything you throw at us. So training is going to be key. And, and I know everyone that's on this podcast right now, uh, you four right here, believe in the same thing. I mean, you need to be training all the time and train for that unexpected. And understand that in TRT and hazmat, it can't be black and white. 
it, it's going to be a little gray. You got you got to be able to think outside of the box. There's not an SOP for every single special ops call you get. It, it's just not going to happen. The reason why you're there at that specialty station is because you can think outside the box. Just like you said, I mean, the bandsaw. The bandsaw is a vital piece of equipment. And that is one of those things that you want to make sure that you're using it correctly. Um, just making sure that you understand that if it doesn't go your, your way right away, that you have another plan. And, and I can't reiterate that enough. So for me with my guys, I sit there and I, I go, okay, look, look, plan A is this. If plan A isn't working after two tries, guess what? We're going to plan B. This is plan B. And I make sure that the guys understand the plans so we can move forward. Because like I said, if, if you call us in, well, guess what? It, it shits hit the fan and it's, it's real. And you're calling us for help, guidance, and tools. And it's not an ego thing. It's none of that. It's just we've taken the time to get the extra extra classes. We get to train on it all the time. We have the tools for it. So to answer your question, Trevor, it's uh, honestly, it, it's going to be a lot of training. And uh, I know we're getting close to wrapping this up. I can't reiterate enough. Find out your, uh, your mutual aids for your special ops, your, your hazmats reach out and, and ask those guys to train with them. And if you can't train with them, at least go through and see what their capabilities are so you understand. Great stuff, Herb. Appreciate it. Ben, you want to uh, send us around the horn and get us out of here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so here we go. The, the last time around, just our closing thoughts. Uh, I think Herbie kind of tied it up nice there um, with, you know, get out, know your teams, I uh, know their capabilities, but let's kick it over to Bobby and, and see his final thoughts. Uh, and then we'll go up to Trevor to wrap it up. Oh, thanks, Ben. Th thanks a lot for coming on, Herbie. Um, a lot of nuggets for me I picked up out of that. And um, it's really helpful to me to think about those things, being pretty much a first-line engine officer. That's good stuff. So uh, just a couple of things to wrap this whole thing up. If you guys notice, i got beautiful Christmas lights up here. Um, I my, my wife... Um, I bought these really cool looking old fashioned lights up. You see that? Yeah, well, we had these Christmas lights up. She likes them so much, she left them up. And I don't think we should have Christmas in July, um, but they're still up. So, if anyone had any questions about who's actually in charge of my household, that kind of gives you a good indication of who is because uh, there's Christmas lights right behind me. Well, that's um, Delaware State Law, right? You got to keep them up all year. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, at least you don't have to put them up next year, I suppose. Uh, and the last thing is uh, the night uh, they're having a NASCAR race, and my son Patrick is. Um, uh, the crew chief for Timmy Hill in the 61 car. So I wish those guys a whole bunch of luck in their race tonight. And uh, Herbie, man, it's awesome having you, brother. Hope you can come back again, man. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Bobby. And uh, you know, for everybody who is tuning in tonight, really appreciate it. Herb, uh, much love and respect, brother. I know uh, you've done a lot, not only here in the state, but throughout, again, the country and the, and the world, not only from a teaching platform, but from a response platform. And uh, you know, especially for me in my department, you know, very, very appreciative of uh, all the things that you've come to my department and shared. Uh, just some closing thoughts. Reiterate the fact about knowing your first dude. Don't think the technical rescue can't happen in your first dude just because you've not had it before or you've not had anything significant. Go around, look, think about how things are going to change, that changing environment, not only on the scene, but we, we talked about different conditions, lighting, weather, anything. Um, plant that person next to you. Uh, you, use some, use some of your other resources. If you have to get, uh, EM involved. And I know Herbie, you work extensively in, in the, uh, in the EOC, uh, recently as well. So look at all these resources so you don't have to juggle so many balls. I mean, part of this is that you, you look and you try to put things in, in their boxes that make sense to you. So if you're trying to command too many things and you don't have the resources, something's giving you a headache, open up another box. If you don't have someone who can do research for you, or monitor the weather, farm that out somewhere because I want to know if there's a thunderstorm coming through. If I'm working in a trench or I'm working, I've got my guys outside in an elevated uh, position hey, underneath Trevor. a lot of metal. So, hey, Trevor, yes, sir. It's Florida. The answer is yes. Yeah, exactly. Or I was yeah. going to say if it gets cold, but I mean when it when it gets about 82, people start putting jackets on. But 
Um, but either way, you look for look for those changing environments. And um, but again, again, you know, thank you all for tuning in. Herb, thank you for sharing uh, your information, giving these people these nuggets, and really having them look at uh, technical rescue through a different lens. Because whether or not you are an engine guy, a truck guy, a rescue guy, eventually you're going to be first due on that call. You're going to roll up, and I think you've given a lot of great nuggets on where to start, how to proceed, and have that seamless operation for when the technical rescue folks get there. So uh, with that, Herb, uh, we'll go back to you, uh, see if you have any final final nuggets or thoughts, and then uh, Ben will wrap it up for us. Uh, honestly, uh, I appreciate you guys having me on. And uh, like I said, get out there and just train as much as you possibly can. Dream up some scenarios that – at your uh, firehouse, like I said, if, it, if it's too hot, too cold, tabletop it. Talk about it. Go out to your truck, pull out pull out the equipment that you have, see if you can even facilitate it. If not, it's better to know now than when you get on scene of that call. Um, other than that, reach out to, the, to your uh, responding units, the, the heavy rescues, the squads, the, whatever it is that, that's responding to your zone for those calls. Reach out to them, and I and I assure you that those guys are willing to to show you what they're capable of doing and and what they're uh, what they're going to expect of you. Thanks, Herb. Thanks, guys. Uh, Trevor, Bobby, thank you guys as always. Um, as we wrap up, just a little um, thing we've got here. So again, special thanks to Herbie Tyler, um, Rescue Consult, Arrest, National Rescue Consultants. Um, I should know that we've only been talking all night about it. Um, so, hey, if you guys want to follow us on social media, here's our stuff. Uh, Facebook, Strike the Box Training, uh, LLC. There's our Instagram and Twitter feeds uh, and our website. And if you're interested in, or if you have questions uh, and want to reach out to us, there's our uh, our contacts. If you guys need, want to get up with Herb and his company, National Rescue Consultants, here's all of their information. So there's his website, uh, the Facebook, Instagram, uh, email and phone number and uh, if you guys go to our Instagram page uh, or uh, through our uh, our Facebook page uh, we have it linked or we have uh, him tagged in this so you can make it easier to reach out and, and contact him and, uh, and go from there and then finally Thursday Thursday number 10 uh, water safety so we're, we're going to wrap up uh, July um, with water safety that'll be July 23rd at 7 p.m. Again, like we always have, Facebook and YouTube live, uh, so you'll be able to catch us there. And then uh, as a special guest, Lieutenant Dell Hollywood Baker of the Ocean City Fire Department, uh, retired. Uh, he'll be our special guest to help us uh, go through some water safety, water rescue events, uh, and stuff like that. So as we, get, as we head on out, um, again, thank you guys. Uh, if you have questions, uh, I think last time there were some folks in uh, a watch party. They don't; sh those comments, those questions don't show up in the comments uh, that we can see to to address and a and answer. Uh, so, if you have questions, post them in there uh, or in our our feed here, and we'll get back to you. Um, otherwise, Herb, if you could give us a squad nod, and we're going to head on out of here. There it is. Cheers, guys. Thank you. <laughs>